Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to designing a driver circuit for a bipolar stepper motor and this is part two in a two-part series. If you haven't seen part one yet, I'd recommend you watch that first. And I'll just preface what I did in part one. This is for bipolar stepper motors, not unipolar and not other types of electric motors. This is focused on step bipolar stepper motors. If you're interested to check out uh, Forstronics.com for uh, information on our design, manufacturing, and training services, if you like what you see here, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel and let's get started. Okay, I covered this in part one, so I'm just gonna zip over, but the idea here is this tutorial is how to design a motor driver circuit from scratch using basic components. Now, there is ICs out there that you can use for driving a motor. I mentioned in the first one, I'm not going for the IC because for this design that I'm working on, we're trying to get the parts cost as low as possible and we can use pretty low cost parts, especially because I'm using a low power motor versus using an IC, an off the shelf IC. Now, one thing I will mention though, is you have to be careful is if you have a bunch of components, you can have higher manufacturing costs, uh, but we don't think that'll be a problem for, for us. Okay, and in part two, we're gonna go over the finished PCB and see the finished PCB in action. And I will say there's a correction from part one. So I changed the circuit a bit. So I'll go over that here in part two. Okay, once again, this is another review, and this kind of just shows how to drive a bipolar stepper motor. The ones and zeros mean power is applied and current is flowing from you know, that direction to the zero direction. So for one, you have current flowing from A plus to A minus and B plus to B minus. And here I show some of the color codes. The motor that I'm working with that you'll see is, is the color code number two, brown, orange, red, and yellow. Okay, now let's review some of the design changes or circuit changes that I made. Okay, here's the circuit from, from part one. And I will say that a, a watcher actually helped point this out for me. So I, I appreciate it. I, I don't have their name in front of me, but I, you can see their comments in the comment section. So thank you to them. And the problem with this circuit, the way it is, is I have end channel MOSFETs at what's called the high side. It's often called the high side. And the problem with this, well, I should jump down here. End channel works great when the source is tied to ground, right? Because to drive an end channel MOSFET, you need the gate to be more positive. And when I say more positive, typically there's a V threshold or voltage threshold value. You need the voltage threshold value to be more positive than the source. It works great when the source is tied to ground, right? Because it's always going to be at zero. The problem is though, is in this case, this source is not tried, tied to ground and you actually get a voltage drop across the windings of the motor, right? The motor has some kind of finite resistance and you get a voltage drop. Well, what happens here is this end channel MOSFET is only driven on as far as V threshold can go before the voltage drop at the source becomes close to V threshold. So for instance, if I have five volts and I don't know, V threshold is I don't know, let's say 1.5 volts, and I'm driving this with a five volt signal, that means I'm not gonna be able to get my full five volts here. I'll get something like VCC minus V threshold. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And that's why in part one, the motor still worked. It'll still work. It's just, you're not gonna get the full voltage drop across it. Okay, now we're looking at the updated circuit that will work. And I'm just showing one of the H bridges. Remember, there's two of them. And I'm just showing H bridge A and of course H bridge B is the, the same thing. But what I did here is I'm using a P channel, which works much better as a high side switch. So here the P channel source is tied to VCC. So it's sort of upside down compared to the N channel. And the idea here is we need the gate to be more negative. V threshold is negative compared to the source. Well, that's easy here because VCC is tied to the source. So if we make this zero volts, we'll turn this on right away. And we can fully turn it on and get the full five volt drop across our motor windings. Now I will mention though, you'll see another part. I do still have an end channel MOSFET here. And I did that because, you know, with CON1, I have CON1 down here. I want to use the same one to drive both the end channel and the P channel. The problem is, is I need a zero here, not a one. So I have an end channel MOSFET here that's serving as a NOT gate. So if, if you're familiar with digital logic, you know, a NOT gate takes a one or a zero and turns it into the opposite. So what I'm doing here is when 
connector is one, con one is, is one, or I should say high, or five volts, it essentially turns on this MOSFET. This acts like a short, and this basically feels ground, or zero volts, and it turns on this P channel. Now, if this is low, it turns this gate off, and I have this 10 kilo ohm pull-up resistor that makes sure that this is the same voltage as the source, so it stays off. And if you notice, I also have 10Ks on, as pull-downs for the end channel so they don't turn on during uh, operation. And then I talked about the rest of this circuit in part one, so I'm not going to go over it. Let me just do this so you can see that there's two of them. And then I'll briefly show the layout. Now, these files will be on GitHub, and I'll, if you go to the description area of the video, you'll, you'll see a link. But here is my layout. And I don't think there's too much to say here, except that you know one thing you want to be careful of is the motor gets inputted at pH 1, pH 2, pH 3, and pH 4. So you want to make sure that those traces are kind of fat, right? Because they're going to have a little bit of current on them. Same with VCC. So VCC is going to be heavy on the current. So we want to make sure we have nice big traces for that. And we use correct spacing and things like that. But this is the layout. I was just trying to make it a little compact. Is there anything else I want to say about this? No, I, th I think I'll just mention the input. So I have VCC and ground. We need that on the input. This is where the motor would connect. And then this is where the Arduino board or whatever microcontroller you're using to control it would go in and uh, change the different, uh, turn on and off the different parts of the H bridge to get current flowing the direction you want it to flow. Now you might notice there's a lot of components on here. Now I will mention you could possibly skip the one kilo ohm um, gate resistors. They may not be fully necessary. They're often there as just a current limiting protection. Also, I used single shot key diodes, but you can actually buy dual shot key diodes. And actually for my design, I'm changing my diodes to dual. They have the same package and I'll show you a part number at the end that you can use instead of this. Okay, with all that said, let's see the new circuit in action. Okay, here we're looking at the board. I got it in red and I built it up uh, by hand. And uh, I will mention I, I, was, I didn't have my Zener diodes in yet, so I don't have my Zener diode here. And a Zener diode's needed for protection. Basically, if the voltage goes too high, it creates a low resistance path to ground. And that's really useful when you're dealing with motors because motors are highly inductive and they can cause flyback and things like that that can make your drive your power supply a little nuts. So you want to have some protection there, and I talked about that in part one. I, here's my Arduino coming in. Here's my power source. I have an oscilloscope hooked up to this so you can see the, the voltage on one of the, the arms. Uh, so that's why this is a little crowded. And then this is where the motor is connected. So let me start the video inside of a video. So there is the board. And I'm going to back up soon and show the Arduino, just using Arduino Uno. And then there is my motor. And look closely, you can see it moving. I, I paused it so you can't see it moving, but uh, I have it turned up to a fairly high speed. This motor is a precision motor, so it has a lot of gears. So this turns actually very slow and you have a lot of fine control because you have a lot of steps to fully get it around. But the, the downside to this type of motor is it takes a while to turn it around. But this is a fairly low power motor. You know, the average current is about 350 milliamps to 400 milliamps total. You know, so it's divided up between these two wires. But just make sure when you make your circuit that you're sizing the circuit and the components and everything to match the current draw of the motor you're working with. So look closely at these gears when I press play again. You can see them moving. The motor is running, the circuit is working. And then what do I do now? I go show the oscilloscope. You can see my power supply, and then I'll just show my oscilloscope. You can kind of see that there's some, I'm measuring directly on one of the windings, and you can kind of see the voltage is a little jumpy, and that's because of the inductive nature of the, uh, of the motors themselves. Anyway, that's a quick video to kind of show the motor in action, to show that it's working, our circuit works fine. Then the last thing I just wanted to cover was the final parts list. So I, I did a parts list for the prototype. Here I'm doing a parts list for the end product. So I have eight end channel MOSFETs, right? Because I have a, a MOS, an end channel for the two low sides of the H bridge 
as well as one for the knot gate to drive the p-channel and below there I have my p-channel parts and one thing you have to keep in mind with p-channel versus n-channel is because of the nature of how they're designed n-channels typically can handle more I should say the same size n-channel MOSFET can typically handle more current than the same size p-channel MOSFET. So just keep that in mind when you're sizing up your, your uh, components. And like I mentioned before, for the example, I use simple uh, single shot key diodes, but you can get dual opposite facing shot key diodes. Here's a part number to cut down on the amount of parts you use. And to be honest, they're about the same cost and they're in the same package. So it's an obvious thing to do. Here I, I use 12 10K ohm resistors. I use eight 1K ohm resistors. Here's the Zener diode I use. It's just above five volts. And you know, here's my warning once again, to use components that are sized for the stepper motor you're working on. And as I mentioned, I'll have my Eagle files on GitHub if you want to uh, pull them off. Okay, that's all for uh, part two in this series for designing a driver circuit for a bipolar stepper motor. If you have any good comments, like I did get one on, on part one, please share them or any tips, please share them. If you have any questions, use the comment section. I, I will mention this. If you go to forcetronics.com, you can you know, fill out a form to contact me if you have you know, design or manufacturing or training service interested in Forcetronics services. Please do not contact me if you're a senior in college and you're trying to look for help for your senior design. I, I will not answer you know, that's up for you to do. Anyway, I just wanted to put that disclaimer in there. If you like what you saw here, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and thank you for watching.